So um, welcome all to this uh, education uh, session, this online training seminar on uh, project um, management. Um, this is a session that DPC program is organizing together with um, Agnes from Project Management Institute Netherlands and Diana from Project Management Without Borders, who will introduce themselves uh, a little bit later. So this uh, session is part of um, many training sessions that have been um, developed under the DBC program, which is the partnership program of IHG Delft, funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so during this session, we will uh, go over the project cycle and we'll also link this to real life examples. Um, the session will be one hour um, education session and at the end there will be half an hour questions. So we will try to answer the questions that people have already during the sessions, but for sure they will be answered at the end of the session. Next slide, please. So um, here you can see uh, me and uh, Diana and Agnes but I will ask them to introduce themselves because they can do that better than me. So please, uh, Diana, can you say a few words about yourself? Absolutely. So I'm Deanna Landers. I'm the founder and president of Project Managers Without Borders, and we also call ourselves PMWB. We're an international volunteer organization that partners with other organizations, other not-for-profit humanitarian organizations, to make them more efficient and effective. And today, I'm very happy to be here. We're partnering with these organizations to bring this material to you. Agnes? Okay. I'm Agnes Verstegen. I'm a certified program manager, actually, uh, with at and a telecom community uh, company. Uh, but part of my uh, certification, I part of the uh, Project Management Indus Institute uh, Netherlands chapter, and um, we bring uh, with the Education Foundation, uh, we bring uh, um, uh, education to uh, volunteering organizations and as well as schools. Thank you. And um, in the back, we have uh, Wim, also from uh, PMI Netherlands. He uh, is uh, the guy uh, that makes it all possible that we are gathering here uh, online. Thank you uh, already, uh, Wim. Next slide, please. So this is a rather abstract picture of uh, the program I work for. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is uh, Nadine Sander and I work for the DBC2 uh, program. Um, which is, as I mentioned, financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I'm a program assistant in this program for a bit uh, more than uh, four years at the moment. Okay, so I will tell a bit more about the program now in the next slides. So this is a yeah, kind of an abstract picture of uh, the program. The program is a 40 million program that uh, financed many different types of activities. It's an IG that Delft Partnership Program, so all the activities are implemented together with uh, IG partners in low and middle income uh, countries. They all address water development challenges and this, this picture presents a little bit the different types of activities we have in the synergy. So uh, we have focus regions in which we do uh, we support education and training activities, research and innovation, and also stimulate innovation through pilot and uh, demonstration. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's it from my side. I would like to hand over to uh, Diana. Hi there. So, yeah, we're going to, in this presentation, we're going to be using one primary example throughout. And, and so I want to give you a background on that now. The, the project we call Water Rico because it was providing clean water in Puerto Rico. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the people that we worked with were Rotary Clubs, multiple Rotary Clubs in the Denver area. 
and Denver, Colorado in the United States. The people that I was dealing with there, they had a really bad experience with the project in Madagascar where they were digging wells, providing water from wells, but they thought that the money that was invested in the wells was way more than the value than they were getting. It wasn't just a financial concern. It was really the value, the number of people serviced by these wells wasn't enough for the finances that they were providing. And, and so they really didn't feel that that was a good experience. And so they wanted to partner with us so that we could see if we could help them in, uh, in their next project. And they, they really needed to identify a new need. They needed to find a community that could be helped by themselves to identify the solution and then also implement it. So our role was to be part of the team and then introducing them to, to project management concepts and helping them put those concepts into to practice in this project. So we identified the key phases of the project to be identifying the community, identifying a solution for that community, implementing the solution, and then obviously supporting as, as we go along. So I'd like to explain these pictures here so that you can understand when I, when I share examples of how that fits into this project management framework, uh, you can see what it looks like, what this project was about. The leftmost one underneath the phrase, phase one proof of concept was of course the proof of concept. If you look between the two people in the front, you can see a little bit of a concrete structure and that is a filter, a water filter. And so we created it out of concrete. The second photo has a little bit better picture of it. The first one was in Denver on the proof of concept. And we did a second proof of concept in Puerto Rico, in the community in Puerto Rico. And that's what that second photo is. And the final product photo over on the right is made out of two buckets and filter. So it's, uh, it's actually, you could notice that it did change over time. Because we had proofs of concept, we were able to identify what worked and didn't and ended up with this product at the right that you see. We ended up with, with over a thousand of these in Puerto Rico in an area that had been devastated by hurricanes. And so when we go through the examples, then you'll be able to, to picture these, these products as, as what we ended up with is and, um, in our project. Okay. Okay, well, um, we designed a, um, a, 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 well, let's say, a, a education with a, a little bit more simplified uh, project management where we uh, go through um, the next couple of slides. We go through the project life cycle. We have in total five phases. The first one is initiate and align. Um, so making sure that uh, as the initial project brief, uh, that you define your goals, uh, your outcomes, your objectives and success criteria, and as well, including uh, the business case part of your program, uh, part of your project. Um, you do as well in the first phase, you do quite a lot of uh, research, uh, trying to get relevant information on the subject, uh, what you need to deliver. And as well, you identify your uh, resources and how you engage with each other. We have included throughout uh, the slides, we have some um, templates, uh, some are in the backup and uh, uh, Nadine will send the presentation as well afterwards to all of you. And you can uh, use the templates if, if, uh, if they are uh, applicable. The next phase is plan the work. Um, so um, my understanding is as an output of uh, your planning process, it's the DUPC uh, proposal, the UPC plan. But in uh, planning the work, it's basically uh, defining, developing all the criteria for your objectives and output, your scope. Um, of course, identify all the things you need to do to deliver upon the objectives, so all the, the uh, uh, activities. And as well, identify assumptions, constraints and risks. We will go to a, a couple of topics in more depth, such as risk management in uh, the next uh, section. Next slide, please. Okay, then we have work the plan and monitor and control. 
officially these are two phases, but uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, so uh, work the plan is basically execu executing on your on your uh, project plan, um, deliver upon the product and outcomes uh, as per agreement and, and the objectives and success, success criteria you have defined. Um, one of the items especially is also uh, iterative planning. So uh, with work to plan, monitor and control, if things happen, uh, you go back into uh, the planning. So we will go through that. And as well, um, one of the key items as a project manager is communication. Communication with your stakeholders and of course um, uh, produce uh, the reporting and, and in, in my understanding in your cases as well, the formal sponsor reporting. So we will uh, go deeper into the communication. And at the last phase, which um, within project management is very important, is uh, to evaluate your project uh, and define lessons learned. Because if you have multiple projects, you can then include those lessons learned into your next project. Um, so we will go through uh, lessons learned sessions and uh, details uh, in relation to that. So that's um, um, the topics where we will go through uh, today. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, on Initiate and Align, um, it's very brief. Uh, we included as well uh, an Excel project workbook. Um, as a project manager, most times we start immediately with your uh, project tracking uh, document or your project workbook. So the data you collate uh, uh, together, you put that in there, uh, making sure that you have one overview of all the uh, items. Uh, but key is, of course, especially in the beginning, uh, agree with your sponsor uh, uh, what you are going to do, what you're going to complete, as well um, do the research. Uh, for example, uh, pull out um, uh, previous experiences of other projects, right? If, if, if there are lessons learned with a similar topic, try to retrieve um, um, the lessons learned of other project teams, uh, because that can help you with planning. Uh, additionally, of course, uh, you need to identify your resources, uh, your key resources, your experts, you need uh, to be able to be successful for your project. And uh, what I mentioned, the project workbook uh, to document everything. Let's go to the next slide. Um, on the business case, um, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, in relation to in, in the beginning of your uh, initiate or your uh, project brief, indeed, uh, the business case should be included because that's uh, basically the, the benefit or the impact you're going to deliver. So as part of your project brief or for an initiation, indeed, the business case uh, should be part of the initiative, initiative phase because that's uh, where you build uh, your plan upon. So yes, in, in, the, in the project, uh, in PMI, we talk about a project charter, um, but the project uh, uh, brief needs to include as well the business case because that's the, the constraint uh, you need to work in. Um, after the project brief, then you go into your officially uh, planning. And of course, um, you can have several tools. So we have, uh, for example, the mind map and also uh, you can use for brainstorming and uh, um, as well, if you brainstorm, you need to fine tune and uh, prioritize your ideas. So we do have um, some documentations for that. And of course, um, uh, define and uh, define your scope. So based upon, of course, the, the business case and the brief, uh, you need to identify your critical success fa factors as part of the, uh, the project um, plan uh, because that's where you are measured upon and where you deliver your project according to. Um, uh, one key item uh, where, well, at least from a project management point of view, I really like is the work breakdown structure. Um, and we will go into uh, one of the next slides, we will go into more deeper, uh, but that's to decompose your project in manageable work packages. Uh, but it's good to do that together with your team. And then, of course, you create your schedule uh, based upon the, the work breakdown. Uh, you plan all the activities, uh, making sure when, what and who and how uh, you will deliver uh, upon your ob objectives. 
So let's go into the uh, next slide. Yeah, um, just as an example of what we just talked about, the um, the the project example we've been talking about with the Water Rico is it's a small project. And uh, actually, let's just scoot back to one slide so that we can uh, talk about that just briefly. The, uh, the point was we did identify the critical success factors, as Agnes had mentioned. We identified that we needed to have a location that we needed to find a location that was close to the Rotary Club in the United States because they didn't want to have an experience like with Madagascar where they flew halfway around the world and then they had a bad experience. So we identified that we needed to have a sustainable situation. A, a, they were a, a people who wanted to find a problem to solve close to them. Whereas I know most of the time you, you would have a problem that we, we go to solve because the problem exists. This was people who wanted to help who went out to find a place to help. And so we, we helped them with that. There, so when we, we looked, uh, we used some of the tools that Achnes mentioned. We, we brainstormed to find something that was close to the United States that had a water need and ended up with several options, prioritized those and researched into those locations. I ended up eventually identifying Puerto Rico since it had suffered a lot of damage from two hurricanes in a row. And that damage in, impacted their infrastructure, water, power, and, and a whole lot more. And so Rotary identified the solutions and we made sure that we proved the concepts before going on site, putting that planning into the project as you've seen in the, in the photos before. Okay. okay. Thank you, Diane. Um, on the work breakdown structure, um, so you can define um, the work breakdown structure in, um, uh, you can do it by phase or by category, so dependent uh, on, on the project. And uh, basically, what you need to do is take the what of your uh, project scope, right? What do you need to deliver? And then uh, try to organize that in uh, uh, groups, uh, which makes sense in uh, every time decomposing to the next step. So basically, uh, when your rig brush structure is complete, is when all the deliverables in your scope and your project are included, and you go to the level of uh, work, up, work packages so that it can be executed. And with this work breakdown structure, it ideally is to do that together with your team, because then you are already familiarizing uh, your team with, uh, uh, with what needs to be delivered and also have, of course, all the expertise as part of it uh, for that. Uh, and then, uh, of course, in the end, with each workable item, um, you can easily go into the next step, which is then creating your schedule, putting a timeline to it and, and uh, resources. Um, and uh, the other benefit would be on the rig breakdown structure later on in, the, in communication or status reporting that you could design it in a way that also from a milestone perspective, you can do that on a level of your rig breakdown structure in understanding wh whether your project is um, uh, well green and uh, performing well. Overall, also in uh, scheduling, my understanding is that um, in general, the schedule is, is uh, uh, scheduling is um, uh, performed well. Um, but always, of course, be smart, uh, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. And to answer the question on uh, whether there's a thumb rule as to what percentage of the project budget and the time should be ideally spent on project management, um, well, from a PMI pers perspective, you do fit for purpose. So, um, and, and so there is not a, a rule of thumb, I would say. Uh, but from my experience perspective, uh, the more you plan, uh, the, the better your project uh, flows, uh, especially if we go into some of the next slides in, in relation to uh, risk management. Let me go to, to, to add to that. I would say that 
um, you can either do it right or you can do it over. And, um, you know, if you don't do your right, you're planning in the beginning, then you end up spending time on what you shouldn't and you end up taking more time than you should have anyway. So there's huge value in, in that plan. So uh, just as an example for the WBS, the goal in our Water Rico project was to positively impact the community by providing dependable, clean drinking water. And so when we, when we were there, we realized that there were two cultures we were dealing with, the Rotary culture and the Puerto Rican culture. Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States, has a different language that's spoken there, and things are, are quite different from the team that was Rotary from the United States. And when we combined those, we recognized that we really needed some flexibility. So we did create a WBS. We, we provided with project management discipline, we're able to help them get better results through using the WBS instead of a schedule, which was kind of interesting. You know, the, the time frames weren't, weren't there. In larger projects, I, I worked with for IBM, and it's very clear you have your, here's your schedule, and this is very straight. You do these sorts of things, at least from a waterfall perspective. In this case, it was very flexible and it needed to be, but the WBS was essential to keep going back to, here's what needs to happen. We had a counterpart project manager in Puerto Rico from the Rotary, and his role was to coordinate there, and he chose much less granular tasks like uh, or maybe they were you know, like provisioning, um, assembly of the, the units, training and things like that. And there were individuals responsible for those. And they it, it, it was really important to them to have that responsibility, but they didn't want to be have it broken down into very extremely detailed tasks. And so the WBS was essential. Uh, the key point there was to have the discipline, the framework, but be aware that it can be improved. And it's just more important uh, to, to have that plan and the flexibility in case the situation changes. Back next. Okay. Next slide, please. And um, Despite the fact that everyone with planning thinks about the schedule and objectives and everything, um, key for us is also um, risk management and communication. So starting with risk management, if you made any assumptions or uh, whether you have any constraint, basically that induces a risk. So um, for us, the risk management is, is more important because uh, very important because it's also a mechanism that you um, have uh, to communicate to your stakeholders. Because if you took an assumption and if the assumption is not true, then of course it has impact on your project. So if you, um, as part of planning, you identify upfront um, all the risks you can think of, which are relevant, of course, but most times induced by assumptions or specific constraints or potentially working with uh, third parties um, to um, to document them, but also to together with your team and also share with your stakeholders uh, to identify, OK, what if this happens? What will we do? So uh, as part of a risk management plan, always we have a description of the risk uh, and yeah, officially you can have a negative risk and also a positive risk, so an opportunity. So if you identify an opportunity to have additional gains, etc., yeah, that could also be that's also a risk because um, it will have impact to your project because if you go after that, uh, potentially your timeline or you have additional cost. Uh, impact is identifying. Okay, what? will the impact be on your scope, on your cost, on your schedule, your benefit you would like to deliver, and as well the likelihood of occurring. So uh, to together with your team to identify, okay, what is the likelihood that this will happen? And uh, based upon that as well to identify a risk response strategy. Uh, so what can you do to minimize the risk or even in some instances to avoid and uh, yeah, prevent it uh, overall? And of course, in that perspective, it depends as well, uh, because um, you plan 
or you add additionally either uh, cost uh, to that particular risk or you have additional cost to mitigate and also potentially impact as impact to your schedule. Uh, but documenting that uh, makes it clear to everyone and also to your stakeholder if this happens. Uh, then it means that the impact to the project will be that uh, the delivery will be one month later or we would have additional cost, etc. Of course, as part of the risk plan, you also have ownership. So identifying the person who is uh, the owner of that particular risk strategy and to also to monitor the risk because it could always be that the risk is not occurring and your assumption was correct, so it will not happen. Uh, but assigning an owner to that specific risk is also part of the plan. And of course, a risk trigger. Sometimes you have indicators up front that uh, probably a risk will be materialized and that you then can trigger uh, the response tr strategy. And um, it could also be and communicate uh, a part of the, uh, the plan, communicating the, the risk and the impact and everything. Um, of course, <laughs> some things you uh, un then we talk about of uh, about unknown unknown. Sometimes you don't know, uh, and that will be part of the issues. But the key is is that uh, via the risk management that you uh, identify the the known uh, unknowns, and then also uh, provide a, a little budget most times uh, as part of your plan to uh, mitigate or to uh, respond to those. So, to those known unknowns. Uh, shall we go to the next slide? Um, we have several uh, risk responses. So um, one is avoidance, so to eliminate it uh, completely. So uh, that you can take an action to either reduce the probability or the, uh, the impact to zero. Um, you can transfer it. Uh, so that means that you can insure it or you uh, transfer the risk to a third party um, um, uh, for that. Of course, it will not eliminate the, the uh, total risk, but then um, basically it transfers the liability some, to someone else. Uh, then you have mitigation, so to minimize, I would say, the impact. So if in some instances you can't avoid it completely, uh, but uh, you can uh, reduce the either the probability or the impact uh, to your project. And additionally, uh, the last one is to accept. Uh, so as part of your plan, and, and that's why I mentioned as well, most times there is a, a budget reserved. In some instances, it's either too, accept, uh, too expensive uh, to do something about a, a risk, um, and especially depending on what the probability is, um, uh, so you can also accept it and say, okay, we accept the delay, we accept the additional cost and uh, if that is occurring. So overall, you prioritize your risk because sometimes the likelihood is very uh, low um, or and the impact is very high, vice versa, but you prioritize them and also together with uh, the sponsor and stakeholders, you identify, okay, which risk and which strategy you would like to apply. Let me go to the next minute slide. And Diana, can you go through an example? Absolutely. So, so this is an example of the risk management log for the Water Rico project. And we identified many risks. And these, this is just a couple of examples that I want to talk about. But a lot of them don't turn into issues, and some of them do. They're issues when they become realized. And when we look at the first one, this is one of those examples that became a known, a known unknown. And originally we didn't realize this was a risk. We had a, a goal to have a community that had a need. And so we I first identified, before identifying Puerto Rico, we identified a community in Mexico that had this need. And we talked with the community, a few mem multiple members of the community identified that they had a need for clean water that was easily attainable um, and you know, dependable clean drinking water. We started working with them and after a bit we learned that 
there was a need, but not as strong of a need as we had thought. It turns out that there was a water delivery person or multiple water delivery people who were providing water, it, but it, people had to pay for it in the community. And it wasn't as often as they would like, it was inconvenient for them. But if we were to show up and, and provide a well or a filter or whatever our solution was going to be, we might be impacting the livelihood of these folks that provided water from a truck. And at that point, we realized we, we needed to abandon that community as the option for our solution because we they actually didn't have a great need. They had, it was a bit inconvenient, but their need wasn't as great. And we certainly didn't want to negatively impact the community. So then it was identified that that was a risk going forward. You know, the trigger in that case was very clearly the notification from the people that were providing water in the first place. So we identified that as a risk for future locations that we would, uh, communities that we would go to help. And we absolutely would avoid, we would, we would not move forward if that risk was, was realized like it was in that Mexican community. The next one is that we wouldn't be able to get materials locally. It was also a, a very important goal to be sustainable with this project. And so we needed to make sure that we didn't have to bring a lot of equipment or materials from the United States and we could get it in Puerto Rico, which was uh, you know, where we ended up having the project. And so what we ended up doing is we recognized that we would mitigate as much as possible with, uh, with the materials. We would make sure that we could identify and locate all of the materials that we could in Puerto Rico. But then if there were any sort of a triggering event every year there's hurricane season if that were to happen again it might be that the the materials aren't available for for new filters so we were going to accept that part because it happens so infrequently but also we could we could ship material if required so we it was a combination of both we mitigated by choosing a solution a technical solution a product that we could use the materials that were on site. But of course there was a risk that sometimes there wouldn't be those materials, but those were in cases that were not very likely to happen uh, very often in any case with the, the hurricanes or other some sort of disaster. So this is actually the log that we use to help us review and validate where we are, understand, what we needed to do ahead of time to to mitigate and and identify how to handle it if they happened you know as those risks so we could avoid them or or mitigate them as appropriate next slide and to answer the question uh, whether um it's uh, just a, an emergency management or uh, um, what is necessary for long time risk management well, risk management is part of uh, your full project. So it is, again, iterative. Um, so, and you monitor it uh, during your project. So it could be that as part of um, yeah, what we do, uh, as part of the, the project, also uh, discuss risks uh, continuously. So if, uh, because additional risk can occur or additional risk can appear. So it's a, a, a risk log is a living document and you adjust it according, uh, yeah, how your project is, is uh, um, uh, going and uh, add to it or in some instances, uh, if um, you can add as well a timeline. So sometimes you have very, um, detailed risk plans, uh, depending on your project, it's it's fit for purpose, uh, but you can include as well timelines to it. So uh, making sure that with the owner, that maybe the risk only is a, during a period of your project, and then if it didn't occur, then you close it. Um, and it can be additional risk can be added. So it's a continuous um, activity you do during your project. Um, and it's part of planning and later on we will say it that's why we talk also about iterative planning but uh, we will go in 
a couple of slides, we will go more in depth to that. As part of your plan, you also plan communication. So um, uh, to create a communication plan, so uh, who needs what information to your stakeholders, also to your project team, when would they need the information? So not only the official, I would say, uh, status reporting, etc., but also uh, uh, status uh, or communication with your project team or with uh, suppliers or specific stakeholders. Um, and the communication always uh, consists of who, when, where, what, and how uh, you deliver that communication. So it could be either a meeting you have on a regular basis or you have an official status report or um, 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 so all the documentation of all the communication is uh, documented in the plan. Of course, still depending if you if uh, during your project you have an issue and then you have ad hoc meetings, uh, those will not be part of your communication plan uh, if they are not regularly, but in general uh, plan your communication. And as well, uh, with that, you ensure that uh, you uh, provide to your stakeholders, and that can include the sponsor, all your stakeholders, that they have the right information at the right time to achieve the objectives and uh, yeah, see the results of the project. And uh, th that's the way how you uh, uh, show your progress on your project. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, Diane, do you have an example on the communication? Oh, no, sorry. Um, uh, I didn't, but, but I guess I'll mention why I, I didn't. And that was, this is a very small project. And so we actually used status reporting for communication and, and had, uh, you know, these regular meetings between the, the teams where that was the plan. We would talk very frequently and, and it was a very small project. So. There wasn't a lot in that space that we did. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Well, as soon as you have your plan, and then it needs to be signed off by your sponsor and your stakeholders that they know what you do, uh, that they know the risks, etc. And then, of course, uh, after approval, you execute on the plan. Um, and what I mentioned, work the plan, monitoring, controlling, go hand by hand. Uh, uh, because, of course, um, if you deliver, you also need to check whether you deliver according to success criteria and everything which you agreed with uh, your stakeholders. And um, with that, <laughs> if something deviates, uh, because, for example, quality is, a, uh, you have your quality, your cost, your schedule, your scope, your budget, and what you are going to deliver, uh, if you deviate, uh, then uh, you need to adjust your plan accordingly and to have that iterative planning. Because overall, I think um, there are rarely projects who are executed without any issue or without any changes. Um, so it's part of uh, what we do uh, and it's part of why we are there um, uh, for that. And the key, of course, as well, as soon as um, um, you deliver and according to the plan, you also uh, provide a project status. You gather all the documentation during the, the work, the plan, and, and basically part of the monitoring and controlling uh, that you uh, gather the status where you are on the project and communicate it as according to plan. So let's go to the next slide. And that's um, the iterative planning. So uh, often, uh, when we do or when we create a schedule and depending we have now as well uh, a lot of agile uh, approaches etc so but overall uh, you plan uh, you create a plan you made assumptions things happen right uh, you have unknown unknowns so overall um, uh, planning is uh, well executing and planning it's iterative uh, so if you deviate from your scope or something happens or you have an additional opportunity and uh, you need to go back uh, to your planning and uh, adjust uh, your plan in agreement with the stakeholders, have that discussion and saying, OK, um, we assumed uh, that we have a third party or that resources were available. Something happened. 
uh, maybe uh, someone had an accident. <laughs> yeah, it's something you can't, uh, you need to deal with. So uh, basically you go back to your planning. So you go back to your schedule, you identify, okay, with this change, uh, it's basically change management with this change. What is the impact? What are the possibilities? You uh, create a new plan uh, and then uh, agree with your stakeholders. And um, I think that's one of the key items sometimes, depending on what type of process you have, the, the planning and all the, the agreements are made uh, very early uh, with a lot of assumptions and then you start executing. It could be that there is a, a quite some time in between. Uh, so you need to assess as well, is, are my assumptions still correct? Are, um, are we delivering? Are there any things we didn't think about? Because that could still happen. And then you go back into planning and then execution. Um, most times with this assessment, um, you constantly assess your time, cost, assumptions, constraints, and risks um, uh, with this uh, iterative planning. Diane, can you uh, give some examples from your uh, perspective? Absolutely, yes. So we had a situation where you remember the, the photos from the beginning where we had our, our phase one, uh, our, our proof of concept, and then what we ended up with were very different. And this is a result of this iteration. We, we found that when we created our filters out of concrete, we went out there to, uh, to Puerto Rico and we showed people how to use them. We, we showed them how to create them in their own community. And it all went very well, except for the feedback that we got was, first of all, they weren't portable. We had to identify where they were and it would be very difficult to move them. And that meant that they weren't shareable. The community really wanted to have you know, maybe one family use it some days and another family use it another day, if they didn't have one per family. They wanted to, to be able to have it as a community solution and not some have them and some don't. And so they, we worked with the community after providing one in a shared spot. So there was a recreation center so they could all go and use that filter. But what we ended up identifying is we really needed to improve the design, improve the situation, plan for a different solution. And, and we didn't recognize that with all of the input even that we got from the people when we weren't on site. When we went on site, those stakeholders were able to help us identify that we did need a new plan. We needed to iterate. We learned a lot about where and when and how, but the solution needed to change. So what we ended up with were, was a solution, a product that entailed just, it just was two plastic buckets with a piece that was easily ordered. It, it was not local. So that was, that goes back to our risks. We had, there was one piece that was very important that we needed to get from someplace else, but everything else was was local. It was very easy to get these buckets. They could move them. And as a matter of fact, we started conversations on how locally they could create those, those filter, the actual filter pieces, components of, of the solution. And so just to make the point really clear that I made before, the flexibility leads to the iteration, you, you, iterations, you use iterations to be more flexible. And that was essential in our water recall project. Go to the next slide. Okay. Well, and part of your project, and uh, that's also, um, we have that Excel workbook and it's a, again, a, a simplified version. Um, but it's good to uh, uh, to monitor your project on a, I would say, even weekly, monthly basis on a project level, and then probably monthly, yearly on the sponsor level. What I understand you have, um, um, yeah, formal reporting to do. But as a project manager, it's good to have a simplified way to see uh, how your project is doing. So from a dimension. Um, you can use the red, amber, green. Uh, are we 
overall uh, are we uh, going to meet uh, according the schedule going to meet uh, according the quality etc and but also you can do that on scope time cost and and your stakeholders and especially on the stakeholders also reach out uh, to them to say okay do you think or to your project team in in are we doing well uh, for that and um so you can use that red, amber, green uh, uh, perspective, and then also the trend uh, is important. Are we uh, are we stable? Uh, let's say amber, but stable, or uh, and green uh, for that, but, or are we worsening, right, or improving? So that's also good to uh, to provide in your in your status, and uh, that's also record and document your status on a consistent basis, because then as a project manager, you on on top of things. Uh, also, um, uh, if things happen, what I mentioned, uh, the risks, uh, etc., make sure that you uh, keep track of it uh, for that, because that gives you um, that you, yeah, that you are in control of your project and also easily can uh, report and ask your team as well to be part of that uh, weekly, monthly uh, project level reporting. That's for yourself. And then uh, probably monthly, uh, most times is a fit for purpose <laughs> uh, to do the official or formal uh, uh, reporting. And again, fit for purpose um, as part of your communication plan, um, ask as well your stakeholders uh, what type of information they want to receive and also on uh, which uh, uh, time period for that. Diana. So the Rotary had their own reporting requirements. So this organization we were working with. So we use those reports that were developed from years of experience with small humanitarian projects. But they were really focused on, on the financial. They were financial in nature, but they ventured into the realm of impact but really only at the end. So we had this reporting structure that our partner wanted to use, but they weren't very interested in the reporting as we went along. And so what we identified is when working with our stakeholders that we were able to actually improve performance of realize the, the people involved in this project, every one of them was a volunteer. So we had Rotary volunteers, we had Project Managers Without Borders volunteers, volunteers from the community. What we, we recognized or what we were, help able to, we were able to help them recognize was that we were able to provide incentives to the volunteers from a competitive perspective by putting up there the, you know, sort of on a, a chart that was shared that the various areas of focus like the, the procurement and the, the training and we even put up the, the number of, of units that we had produced for, for the day, for the weekend. There was a weekend where everybody came together, the community helped build these units and we, we reported in both of those ways. We had the people responsible for training. Um, you know, we actually went to an amber color once and it made somebody very upset, but it, it also helped them understand that we really needed to, to make sure that we got that done before so it would be useful. There's no reason to, the, the impact is so little if we were to provide the units without the training. And so when they saw that there was, there was that risk there, there was the, the amber color, they didn't want that associated with their project or their area, I should say, of expertise. And so they were incented to, to keep it green. And so we used it from that perspective, but then also the, the reporting showing, all right, we're at 50 units now, we're at 100 units now. And, um, and that was exactly what happened is the first time around we did 100 units and, or actually the very first time we did three units. Uh, the next time around we did 100 units and then the final trip over, there were 1,000 units. And in order to scale like that, we needed to have those proofs of concept. We needed to, to go through and have everybody very clearly aware of what their responsibilities were. And I think the status reporting, the, the traffic light report was very helpful with that. 
Let's go to the next slide. Okay, and then the last phase, uh, transition and closure. As a project managers, uh, well, as soon as you have delivered everything, sometimes you need to transition uh, uh, things to life cycle or to the organization. And then of course, the last portion, uh, the closure. Uh, some of the key uh, components is uh, to uh, document lessons learned, uh, gather lessons learned with the project team and also with your stakeholders and of course in the end uh, the project closure so summarize your project and and then have a formal close with your project sponsor and or customer uh, for that so can we go to the next slide so uh, lessons learned uh, basically it's uh, what worked well right uh, what worked well what could we have done better uh, what type of risks uh, materialized? Did we encounter issues? Um, were there any obstacles um, um, uh, happening uh, to uh, achieve the full project? Uh, and um, also recommendations. Uh, so what would you recommend going forward? So if someone has a similar type of project or a similar type of activity, are there any recommendations you would do to your future project team? And um, uh, uh, also in, uh, uh, did the project achieve the intended impact? So um, we talk often as well uh, on benefits. We have our deliverables and in the end you want to uh, uh, achieve uh, benefits and impact uh, you want to make. Uh, did the project achieve that and how can you measure it going forward and are there any recommendations uh, in relation to that because if you document all these lessons learned it's uh, good for as a project manager for your experience and for the next uh, project but also yeah also for the next project that you can learn about that diana can you give some examples absolutely so this is this is an interesting example in my mind because the Rotary Club, as I noted, has done lots of small projects and it's always a different person. It's always a different project. They identify the location, the community they will support. They identify the solution all differently. And they did not have an appetite to record any lessons learned. The people who were there involved weren't interested in in doing this project they were going to go off and do something different and interesting in this particular case that the lessons learned was not something that they were interested in doing but i think it could have been valuable but i also see where in their situation from the perspective of the few volunteers that we had as our as our uh, point of contact, that that wasn't something that they would like to do. I've seen that also in business. I've worked for lots of large companies and large companies tend to do lessons learned. The smaller ones don't tend to, they think that it's it, kind of like this small project. So I wanna provide one more example in this case, and that was for actually a different partner that we had, which was SCL Health, uh, a health organization with hospitals and things like that. The project was to take equipment that was in a hospital that was uh, that was decommissioned. They created a built a new hospital next door and they were not going to move the equipment. So they were planning on shipping that equipment to Tanzania for some clinics there. And what we ended up doing is working with them after, you know, during the whole thing, I won't go into those details, but in the end, we had those conversations with them. We said, what did you learn? What went well? What didn't go well? What was the impact of your work? What were the benefits of what, what happened? And what we ended up doing was in, is putting that into an impact report. And that impact report shared what the value was, not just for the beneficiaries, not just for those patients in Tanzania, but for the doctors in Tanzania that learned a new skill, that have new training for the new doctors that came to that clinic, for the people who were the volunteers from the from SCL Health, the doctors that actually flew over to Tanzania to, to provide the training, to give examples of procedures, 
to really help them identify how to use the equipment, the new equipment that was there that, that we had shipped over. And so it wasn't just, and the IT people, there were IT people that went over to put it all together, make it all work. And we provided information on the impact to them as well. They appreciated their work with SCL Health more because they could make an impact to a community. They, they weren't, of course, they were providing impact in their day jobs, but they were able to provide an impact that was above and beyond. And that really made them appreciate their work more. It made them look at their jobs differently, at their employers differently. So uh, a point I wanted to make there is there's just, it's not just the impact for those that are the beneficiaries. It's everybody involved, all of the stakeholders. And then one last point there, it was a huge success story. This was a mission that they did every other year and in this case, they, the management of SCL Health wasn't sure that it was, that it was worthwhile to support this endeavor in, you know, after they finished the last one. And what the organization, the management did that worked with this project is they took our impact report to the leadership of the organization and showed the impact, showed what we measured, showed the impact on their employees, on the doctors there and here, and the, the patients, and that actually was the key bit of information that helped the leadership identify that they would continue with the program because of that value. If they hadn't recorded it, if they hadn't put, it, put that in writing, then they wouldn't have been able to continue with the program and continue to provide those benefits and that impact that we were able to document and share. So that was a huge win from a lessons learned perspective and sharing impact for, for that particular partner. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, and then on the last one, <laughs> the project closure. Of course, you need to ensure that you have obtained your approval from the customer or your, and your sponsor and your donor formally to close the project. And then, um, with all the documentation uh, you created, uh, ensure that you um, um, uh, share that on a uh, shared, um, yeah, retain that on a shared drive or a shared uh, area. And um, of course, um, there's one additional item you need to ensure you finalize close the procurements before you close your project, right? Uh, especially if you're working with third party suppliers. But in the closure document, um, yeah, mention what happened during the project, were the de deviation to the project to, uh, criteria, your objectives, your deliverables, any time, cost, um, uh, uh, what happened with the risk? Did you identify all of them? Uh, were there, uh, let's say, issues of items you didn't identify? And also, was the effectiveness of your response or your plan to mitigate uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, change the, the risk impact, uh, were they effective, yes or no? And indeed include all the lessons learned. So overall, uh, you have your closure uh, documentation and yeah, what we do uh, within business, we have a shared location uh, to retain this project history. Because again, if you, we go back <laughs> into the initiation, we use that as a start of a project to see on the shared location, are there any uh, similar type projects, uh, because not sometimes you are assigned, uh, you haven't done a, a certain type of project yet, so you need to learn that. And uh, this, uh, yeah, let's say project history and documentation is very useful uh, for any new project. Um, so this is the, the project closure. Um, um, so now we are opening up for questions. Before we do that, um, Nadine will send out a survey. Uh, to talk about lessons learned, um, we are uh, we would appreciate if you get uh, provide us feedback uh, on the content. So we have a couple of questions uh, because yeah, we would like to uh, improve as well uh, our uh, education and uh, understand uh, what you uh, 
yeah, what your feedback is of, of this session. So Nadine will send that out uh, uh, probably in the next week to all of you to provide us feedback. So let's uh, open up for questions.